The heart, one of the most vital organs in the human body. It works relentlessly, beating approximately 115,000 times a day, 40 million times a year, in total clocking up 3 billion heartbeats over an average lifetime. It pumps about 2,000 gallons of blood, keeping the body freshly supplied with oxygen and nutrients while clearing away harmful waste matter. The heart begins beating four weeks after conception and does not stop beating until death. But a heart after God, how often does that beat? What makes our spiritual hearts healthy? In the Old Testament, we get an up-close view of our spiritual heart. King David was the eighth and youngest son of Jesse. From the tribe of Judah, David reigned for 40 years in one of the highest and most prosperous periods in Israel's history, the Golden Age. He is known both as a great warrior and as well as the sweet singer of Israel. He was a strategist, great politician, artist, and architect. But above all else, David was a man after God's heart. A man who exemplified faith, friendship, honor, endurance, compassion, worship, humility, and dependence. This summer, join us as we dissect the matter that makes up a heart after God, a heart like King David's. All right. Good morning, Church on the Rock. Woo! I love that feeling. All right. Good to see this place filled. And welcome, welcome. I love to see old friends. I love to see people coming back. Oh, man, it is good. It is good. And we'll continue to pray that God will open up more and more seats for us. Uh, and that, that would be exciting for me. Uh, I love, by the way, one of the things that here at Church on the Rock, one of our, our values is just creativity, keeping things new and fresh. I love the artistry of our own people drawing out these uh, the beautiful uh, images. We have our Pray for My Heart wall. And if you don't know what that's like, after the message, after the, after, uh, as we sing some of the songs, uh, you can go up there and say, listen, could you pray for my heart and write down a way to pray for it? And then I invite everybody, especially those who have a heart of prayer, to go up and pray over those requests. We take them seriously. I know I go and pray over those on Sunday. And so I, I just love how, in a creative way, we can pray for our stretching hearts. So let's dig into, uh, let's dig into this message on uh, the anatomy of a heart after God. Heavenly Father, you are good and great, and you love us. You love every single person in this room. You love every person that's logged on uh, to our live stream. You love every person that is even listening to this weeks or months afterwards. You just love this world, and that's your heart for the world. Help us to gain that heart. Help us to gain this sort of resilient heart during difficult times, God. And I know that resilient heart comes with a heart after you. So, Father, do that heart transplant in each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a lot of uh, vignettes of David's life to go through today. So I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, we have been sort of following King David. He was uh, the shepherd who uh, sort of got thrust into leadership as he saw the problem with Goliath. And so he decided, hey, God is bigger than this guy. And uh, guess what? He's actually worked through me in the past. And so it wasn't a blind leap of faith. It was a, a faith that had some reason. And he went forward and took on Goliath. And uh, we won't go into the gruesome details of that that I've, I've reviewed several weeks. Anyway, then all of a sudden he had this friendship. And there's, there's this, this, this sort of bond of saying, hey, I'm not going to be this lone, lone ranger. I'm going to do this in community. I just was reading reading this, and it was so beautiful, at the parting of Jonathan and David, they were both weeping, and it said David wept the most, just because of that, to do things in community. Then we, we, we talked about being fully dependent on him, 
as, uh, as David did that crazy thing where he was, he was off in enemy territory and he pretended he was mad in front of an enemy king. So we're going to pick up the story there and we're going we're gonna to go through about three vignettes. And so we're going to sort of go through these quickly and pull out the lessons that God has for us today. So I hope, uh, hope you've been tracking with us. But here we go. Here we go. So what happened, where we picked up from last week was David was alone, hiding in caves, writing music. And for all those of you who are musicians, that's a great place. Go and hide somewhere and write some music. Uh, and then uh, 1 Samuel 22, 1-2, it says that, that David left Gath. And Gath was the, the town of Goliath. That's the one he was hiding in. That's the one he was like, uh, uh, pretending he was mad. And escaped to the cave, to the cave of Andalum. And where, when his brothers and father's household heard of it, they went down to him there. By the way, I don't know how they did this, but all through these stories, there seems to be this rumor mill. People are running back and forth. Hey, did you hear? Did you hear? You're going to find this several times. Like, what? Did, they didn't have text. And so I, they must have had people just running around the wilderness. Anyway, so his, his father's household heard that David was hiding in these caves. And they went to him, mainly because, I bet, because they said, okay, hold on, King Saul is murderous, and he's going to come and take us out because we're his family, hold us hostage, or whatever. So they went down to him there. So now, instead of being alone in the cave, there he's got his father and his brothers, who, by the way, last time we heard, were mocking him at the whole Goliath incident. And then let's talk about people, other people came and found out he's there. Let's find out about his winning team. All right, this is a winning team. All those who were in distress, in debt, or discontent gathered around him. Oh, awesome, isn't that great? How would you like to spend a whole afternoon this afternoon with somebody in distress? All right, come on, hands up. Oh, wow, I, in fact, I don't want you to even spend a whole, come on, let, let's have, hey, you know, let's, let's spend the rest few weeks or years with people who are distressed. Wow, sign me up for that one. Or how about people in debt? Hey, can you like spare like some, some money? Like not much. I'll pay you back sometime. No. Like could you imagine that kind of thing, right? Could you imagine? And then, and then people are just discontent, all right? I know you, you sit around and, and talk back and forth uh, over Facebook with them. But it's like to be able to actually live with people who are discontent. Oh, this is so horrible. This is so horrible. You should see the king. Oh, yeah, I know the king. He tried to chuck the spear at me. Anyway, so this is this wonderful group of people. And it says he became their commander. About 400 men were with him, 400 fighting men, which means many of them, most of them, would, you sh would likely have families with them. So he's probably tracking around a thousand people. I'm in my cave alone with my guitar. Now I got a thousand people. I got to feed them. Uh, you know, uh, we're being chased. Now I got to protect them. Yay for being king. Yay, yay. And so what happens? Uh, 1 Samuel 22, verses 3 to 5. From there, David went to Mitzbah in Moab. Moab is a different country. It's, uh, it's about itself. Of, uh, of Israel, uh, south and uh, east, and said to the king of Moab, Moab, uh, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you? I'm going to stop right there. Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you? Uh, why, why? Because he's got some relatives. He's basically sort of semi-connected to Moab. His, okay, <laughs> Bible scholars, you know this, all right, but here's a bit of Bible knowledge for those that don't. You know that there's this person in the Bible called Ruth, right? Ruth and Boaz, all right? The whole, the whole, you know, yeah, patron saint of people that want to get married, all right? Ruth and Boaz, okay? So uh, Boaz is David's great-grandmother. She's from Moab, and so he's sort of got some relatives, but some relationships down there. So would you let my father and mother come and stay with you? Basically, he's protecting his father and mother. And then it says this, and this says this. Until I learn what God will do for me. Can we all just say that part together? Can we all say that together? Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Until I learn what God will do for me. What is David's focus? Not how am I going to get, uh, you know, safe. How I'm going to take care of all these people. What's his focus? His focus is, okay, God's going to tell me what to do next. So we're going to stay here 
until God tells me what to do next. So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. We don't know what this is, but it's, it would be a, a city or, or a, some, some kind of thing with walls around it, most likely in Moab. So basically the king said, here you can stay in the stronghold, and so you're going to be safe. If King Saul wants to come and attack, we're going to protect you as this country. And you're not only protected there, you're actually in a walled city, so you're, you're safe upon safe. Safe upon safe. That's great. But, <laughs> you know, tell me the whole story until you get to the but, right? <laughs> but the prophet Gad said to David, so he's got a prophet in, in, his, in his, his troop. Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. In other words, go back to where Saul is hunting you. And, and why? I, I thought we're supposed to say safe. Isn't, isn't safe the word? Of, of this year and the last year, you, you go around, stay safe, stay safe. What's this generation going to grow up feeling? Oh, 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 stay safe, right? And guess what God is saying? I don't want you to be safe. I want you to go and be unsafe. Yeah, I need to have an amen on that one. <laughs> it's awesome. Go into the land of Judah. So David complained and became discontent like everyone else. No, so David left and went to the forest of Hereth. So it's awesome. Uh, I want you to go into a dangerous situation so I can use you. That's basically what God was saying. I want you to go into a dangerous situation so God can use you. Well, let's look at what happens next. So 1 Samuel 23, 1 to 5. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kayla and are looting the threshing floors. So basically, Kayla is a small city near where he's hiding out. And, and, and that, that small city would, would have a, a very small wall around it. They think it would be like maybe knee high. So this is not particularly a super safe place. Threshing time. They basically, they, they, they worked all the time to get their grain. They go down and they're, they're taking the chaff out, throwing it up in the air. And the Philistine ra raiders are going, okay, uh, have they got the grain done? Let's go and steal it from them. So they're just basically going and, and, and robbing this little town of anything that they would have to, to be uh, for subsistence. Uh, and so David gets the idea. I'm here in Judah anointed as king, but guess what? Nobody else knows I'm king. I don't have the title of king. I'm not even paid to be king. It's like I'm going to be a volunteer king, right? Right, I'm not getting paid for this. I don't even have the title for it. Why do I have to do it? Because God sent him there because there is a need. And so he inquired of the Lord and said, shall I go and attack these Philistines? You, you, you get this sense, okay, I should do that. But isn't this awesome? Just the moment David gets an idea, he goes and asks, he does listening. God, should I do this? God, should, this is all through the story. It's so cool. If anything shows you the heart after God, it says, should I do this? Could I do this? Should I do this? He just is always asking God, should I go and attack the Philistines? The Lord said, go and attack the Philistines and save Caleb. And now, could you imagine this, this conversation? He goes back to his fighting men, <laughs> the discontent, all right? The ones in that said, hey, we're going to go and take the fight to the Philistines. And they're saying, no, no, we, we followed you, okay, so we would be safe. And we were good with Moab, but now you took us to Judah? And now you want us to actually take up arms? Okay, isn't it beautiful? Leadership is such a good thing. <laughs> The Lord said to go and attack the Philistines and save Caleb. But David's men said to him, here in Judah, we're afraid. Get the feeling, right? How much more then if we go to Caleb against the Philistine forces? No. And it's interesting because Saul, all along, would always follow his people's lead. Whatever the people said, he, well, they wanted to keep some, you know, oh, they're leaving now. I, maybe I should go and, and speed things up. He was always looking to the voice of the people. And so... What, what, what is David going to do? How much more then if we go again and attack the, the Kayla, uh, to Kayla and against the Philistine forces? So once again, David inquired of the Lord. So you know what? Sometimes 
if you get an answer from God and you go, hold on, God, did you think about these things? <laughs> like, you know, uh, you know, and not everybody's on board. You got a choice then to disobey or it's okay to go back and get him to clarify. Say, God, are you sure about this? God does not, does not put him down. It's like Gideon. Like how many times did Gideon go back? It's okay to say, God, can you clarify this? So, so, uh, so once again, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered him, go down, go down to Kayla. For I'm going to give the Philistines into your hands. So David was inspired by God, and he went and inspired his people. So David and the men went to Caleb, and they found, fought the Philistines, carry off their livestock. Why is that important detail? Because he's got to feed about 1,000 people. <laughs> so he just hit grocery day. <laughs> he hit grocery day for the next couple months, right? We've got to go and take on the Philistines. They leave and, uh, and, uh, and leave all their food. So he inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Caleb. You would think at this people. Point the people of Caleb going, oh, David, you're awesome. You're just so good. Yeah, that's what happens usually, isn't it, right? So, so he was acting like a king even though he wasn't official. The beautiful thing is, I, I want to bring us back to this. David leads through listening to God. David leads through listening to God. And as somebody in a leadership position, I just I have to do that again and again and again. I just have to say, God, you want us to do this. I, hold on, I thought I heard you say this. I'm going to come back to you. Are you sure you want me to do this? And I just have to keep on coming back to him again and again. So, all of a sudden, David hears that Saul has heard about him being in Caleb and, uh, Kayla and, and he's got this forces coming after him. So, uh, I, how did you hear about that? How did they hear? Again, the people are running around the wilderness telling everybody what's going on. Anyway, this is the, you know, this is the rumor mill before Twitter. Okay. First uh, Samuel 23, 10, uh, 10 to 12. And David said, Lord, God of Israel, your servant has definitely heard that Saul plans to come to Caleb and destroy the town on account of me. He's probably thinking about all the priests in the city of Nob who were killed on account of him. He's, he's probably carrying some of that guilt. He said, I don't want to... Them to, him to tear apart the city. Is this really going to happen? Even though I heard it's, it's happening. Will the city of Kayla, uh, citizens of Kayla, surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? He's asking two questions. Will Saul come down? Will they surrender? And the Lord, uh, Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord says he will. And you go, hold on. He asked two questions. You only got to answer to one. And as sometimes some of us who are trying to listen to God would go, hold on. It just felt like God didn't give me the whole answer. I don't know, maybe, maybe he just wanted to come back to him. Maybe our, our spiritual ears need to be uh, you know, a bit cleaned out. I don't know. So what happens? He doesn't say, well, you only gave me one answer. Okay, no. <laughs> he does. And he will. And again, David asks, will the city's uh, citizens of Caleb surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said they will. So it's interesting. David's listening all the time, even though he knows for sure. And so now he leaves the city of Kayla and now goes back to the caves. All right, now they have, he's got a thousand people. He's got sheep and cattle. You know, it's really hard to hide out this way. And so, so he's going along. He's going along. Okay, the, the, you know, the tracking. You don't need a tracker for this. You just, you know, follow, follow you know, the, the pathway that the uh, animals leave. Anyway, so... He's out in the wilderness trying to hide in caves again. So Saul now comes after him. At one point, the Bible says he's on one. David's on one side of the mountain and Saul's on the other side of the mountain. You know, they're sort of trekking along. This, wouldn't that be a great movie? I, I could see it. I could see this. Anyway, I have been to Israel to this part uh, where you see they hid out in caves. And it it's, almost looks like the Niagara Escarpment. A big, big, long, long, huge, huge sort of hill, big hill. And it's dotted with thousands of caves. So if you're going to go cave to cave, this would take a very long time. And so they were sort of scattered out in these various caves. And, uh, and basically, this was the situation. They were that close to each other. In 1 Samuel 24, 4 to 7, the man said, guess what happened? Well, we're going to find out. They're hiding in the back, back of a cave. You probably know the story. And Saul goes in to relieve himself. Isn't that beautiful, the details of the Bible. <clears throat> 
And his men, I, 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 I can picture this. They're on their belly in the back, back part of the cave with their spears and the sword. And they're saying, do you, do you think Saul's, you know, are the men, hold on, somebody's coming in the cave. Somebody's coming in, you know, man, somebody's coming in the cave. Who is it? It's Saul. <laughs> wow. And, oh, right? Right? Oh. Can you hear some of the guys snicker? And one of the guys says, this is so good. This is God. You know how circumstances are always God's leading? <laughs> they are not. Guess what? Circumstances, you know what they are? Circumstances. <laughs> anyway, so he's there. And this, we're going to pick up the story. It's, uh, 1 Samuel 24, 4-7. The man said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed. Man, he's got to be good. Right? Cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Robe, okay? This would be some kind of official robe to show his troops that he is the king. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken. What for? For having cut off a corner of his robe. It's like he dishonored the king. He said, I should not have... I should not have cut that off. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord's. These words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. Saul left the cave and went on his way. They got news that the Philistines were attacking somewhere else. He took the troops with him. And they were left alone. We're going to try and tie up all these little vignettes together into a into one point, one point. So here we go, here we go. Uh, it's interesting how David had this quality in his heart. This quality is this, this word. It's called honor. He honored the disaffected, those who in debt. He didn't send them away. No, find your own way. I, I only want people to help me. No, he honored them by taking care of them. He honored his parents like, wow, great, thanks for coming along. You're going to have to follow me. No, I'm going to honor my parents by actually making sure they're okay. Does that sound like somebody else? Like maybe Jesus on the cross? Like he's gasping for air. And what, what, what does he do? He's go, take care of my mom, <laughs> right? Why? He's honoring his parents. He honored King Saul. Let me, let me just do a little catch up on King Saul here. He is an evil man. Evil man. King Saul, he's lost his mind. He's chucking spears at people. Number three, King Saul is demonized. Right? But King David honors him. He feels horrible that he dishonored him. And then most of all, he just like honored the voice of God again and again. Once God said something, okay, I'm going to do it. God said something, I'm going to go and do it. I'm just going to do it. Have you ever been around big dog leaders? People who are confident, who know. Like I, I, I always like the, uh, the, the four uh, personality types. There's the lions. Those are, those are the big dog leaders who are in charge. They make decisions easy. And uh, we love to follow them. The opposite of them are the golden retrievers. They just wag their tail and say, love me, okay? Okay. Uh, then we have the beavers who are hard at work, and they get a lot of stuff done. And then opposite of them, they have the otters who are like, fun, 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 all right? So that's how the four personalities work, right? So, so just to let you know, just to let you know, this is, God has a sense of humor. I am a golden retriever. They're <laughs> like, love me. <laughs> But if you've ever been around a big dog leader or a lion leader, one of the hard things that, and David is this, this big dog leader, one of the good things that about them, they're confident, they make decisions easily. One of the things that is really hard for a big dog leader is to honor other people. It's just hard for them. So David is working against his natural bent to be able to honor people. Let's look at how he did this and how the scriptures ask us to do this. First of all, the scripture asks us to honor all people. David uh, uh, took in the distressed, uh, those in debt, those who disconnected. He he did, he honored people who did not deserve respect. Kind of like Jesus, right? 
Jesus, when the sinners and tax collectors came close, you know, I love it in Luke 15. They're coming close, pressing in. And he said, yes, isn't this exciting? And he tells the story of the, of the lost coin and the lost sheep. He said, listen, when you find these people, you're supposed to be putting up balloons. You're supposed to be, like, excited about this. And so David comes in and honors all people. Uh, Psalm 8.5 says this. What are mere mortals? That you should think about them. He's talking to God. True. We are mere mortals, God. Human beings that you should care for them. Why, why do you even care for us, God? Then it says this. Yet, you made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. We honor every single person that God has ever made. Why? Because they deserve it? No. Because they're made in the image of God. Every single race. It, in prejudiced societies, we will honor every single person no matter what. We will honor the smart. We'll honor those who are not so smart. We'll honor those who are rich. We'll honor those who are needy. We'll honor every human being even while they're still in the womb. We will honor every person. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. And so, God loves each person. He's drawing them to himself. And so in 1 Peter 2.17, it says this, show proper respect to everyone. Everyone. There's uh, interesting, in my sort of tenure in ministry, God always sends uh, people, uh, Nancy, our children's, uh, we're our uh, children's uh, pastor, she says, uh, they're called extra grace required, okay? And, uh, and they'll, they'll come up and they'll say, Dave, Dave. And, and you know, they're you know, sort of tugging on my shirt. And it's really easy for me to turn, uh, no, because I got a million things I have to do. But, you know, God always reminds me, no, they are made in the image of God. So I'm going to stop and focus and ask, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? It's often, often after that, they ask me about 10 more things. I go, I can't help you with all those things because there's other people too. So I'm not going to follow everything they tell me because I honor God's voice first. But guess what? I will treat them with honor and respect because they are made in the image of God. Show proper respect to every single person. And then the Bible tells us this. Next one is to show special honor to Christians. It says in 1 Peter 2.17, I'm going to continue. It's like a shopping list here. 1 Peter 2.17, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. So I get to love all of you. If you're in the family of believers, guess what? You've entered into a community of love. And love is everything from, from hugs, the good COVID hugs, and, and we're not going to go on screen about this one. Anyway, we're, to, to words of kindness, to, to actually helping each other. We're a community of love here. We're a community of love. So show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. And in Romans 12, 10, it says, be devoted to one another in love. How do you do that? You honor one another above yourselves. So how can I honor you or show you respect, more respect than I even give myself? I'm going to honor everybody here. Everybody here. And that's why I love being in the family of God. If you're not in the family of God yet, you've got to come, man. There's all kinds of reasons. Your sins are forgiven. You get to know God. <laughs> you get prayers answered. You get a heavenly father. But you get a community of love. If you want to come into a community of love, this is what the local church should be. It should be a church of love where we're helping each other out. Uh, man, we should be able to share with each other, bear each other's burdens, help each other. And that's, can I just put this out there? Like some people say, well, why go to church? You, can, you know, the message, you know, I work a lot on this message. It might not seem like it, but I do. And the deal is, this is only about 10 to 20% of what the church is. This is, okay, I give too much. 10% of what the church is. So listening online, thank you for listening online. But to be a part of this, this is small groups and volunteering and, and, and loving and helping and, and giving words of encouragement and, and natural ones and supernatural ones. It's just, it's just, it's a community together. I love Christians, man. I remember, I remember uh, going into Starbucks once, and there's a guy with a Bible. He's reading the Bible. And, I, you know, I don't bother people that much. So I see him, a Bible. I go over to man. Are you a believer? He says, yes, I am. And I go, I am too. And in this great verse, you know, family, it's awesome. 
Awesome. It's kind of too bad because he said, well, what version of the Bible do you read? <laughs> the right one? <laughs> Come on. Come on. We're brothers. I got to make sure you're the right brother. Ah, oh, okay. Anyway, God bless those Christians too. I got to love them. Too. Right, right, right. We love them all. We love them all. All right, so we are supposed to show honor to everybody. We're supposed to show special honor to Christians. We're supposed to honor our parents. We're supposed to honor our parents with a promise, all right? David has taken care of his promise just like Jesus did on the cross. It's a part of the Ten Commandments. It's the only Ten Commandments with a promise. All right, I remember hearing this when I was a teenager. And it's tough to honor your parents when you're a teenager. Can I just say that? It's tough because they become really stupid really fast. They smarten up about when you're about 25, but there's that gap. <laughs> about 15 to 25, you, you know, wow, they become real dumb. Anyway, Exodus 20, <laughs> verse 12 says, honor, this is part of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother. And it doesn't put a period there. It says this, so that you may live long in the land that your God, Lord God has given you. And uh, it was explained to me, hey, do you want to live longer? Yeah, yeah. Then honor your parents. That's like a, that's better than, you know, oil of Olay or whatever it is that, that lets you live longer. Honor your parents. We think this is for little kids, but Jesus, we, Jesus, like, <laughs> he came into the face of people. They're saying, listen, uh, we, we're, the money that we're going to take care of our, our parents, on, we're going to give somewhere else, and that's okay. And Jesus said, no. And, in other words, when your parents are older... We're supposed to continue to honor them. It's different. We don't honor and obey, but we still honor and show respect. Now, can I say, I know some of you are watching online, some here. This isn't funny. I know you've had abusive parents. I, I get that. I can't speak to that. I've had a set of wonderful parents. Um, stay safe. Keep your extended family safe. But you've got to come to God and say, God, I'm not, how do I still honor them? I'll let you and God figure that one out. My dad, is, uh, I love him. He's up with Jesus now. Uh, when uh, I didn't know a lot about the details, um, this was a long time ago. Uh, when he was, uh, I believe, 16, his, uh, his, his father left his, uh, his mother. And so he grew up in a single parent family. He had uh, three sisters. And being the male back then, it, that's, you, you sort of take care of everybody. So he dropped out of high school. He never finished high school for his whole life. And he got several jobs. He rode a bicycle and delivered, delivered items to different people in order to bring home money so his mom could take care of his, his uh, sisters. Uh, and, and if you ever saw my dad, he had uh, like really kind of weirdly rosy cheeks, and I found out later on he got frostbite from driving the bike uh, to deliver things to people because his dad left his family. Um, one of the most beautiful things my dad did with me, he said, Dave, come on, we're going to go and see somebody. Cool. He says, I, I don't believe you've ever met my dad, he said. His name was Archie. <laughs> and uh, he says he's moved back into town. We're going to help him out. So Archie, his dad, is probably in his 90s, and we went into his house. And, you know, have you seen hoarders? Yeah, that would be a poster child thing of hoarders. And he said, Dave, start to take care of that wall. You're going to clean that up, and let's bring this out. And, and his dad was incontinent, and uh, he would come and, and clean up his dad and uh, give him fresh diapers and tuck him in and kiss him. Um, he taught me about honoring parents, even if they're not the best. I don't know what that means for you. And I know some of you can't do that. I understand. But somehow, if you call yourself a Christian, we need to honor 
our parents. It's interesting, a later story, uh, David meets Saul, and, and, and again, Saul says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, come back to the palace, come back to the palace. You know what David did? He did not go back to the palace. <laughs> he kept himself safe, right? Because he goes, I, I know, you know, he, he was not reconciled. He have gave forgiveness to him, but he did not try to put himself in any further danger. So that's, that's okay. But he was conscious stricken. Because he wanted to honor him. And David honored his parents by taking and make sure they're, they're taken care of. Okay, here's, here's the next one. I should not put the, the title on the screen because so, I know half the devices will be shut off at this one. But it's in the Bible, okay. Come on, give me a break. All right, can you give me a break, please? I'm trying to preach the Bible here. All right, here we go. Honor those in authority. Yeah, ouch. Ouch, yeah. Yeah, Casey, I'm going there. Ah. Uh, Man, I know, I, we don't talk about politics here at Church on the Rock. You know why? Because I want people from conservative, liberal, NDP, even the Green Party, to fall in love with Jesus and actually accept Christ as their Savior. That is, accepting Christ as your Savior is more important than your political, uh, you know, stripe. Can I say that? Accepting Christ, yeah. Thank you. Man. And God's going to have people of every stripe in there in heaven. I think more of one, but I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> First Peter 2.17 says, show proper respect to everyone. Check. Love the family of believers. Check. Fear God. Check. Honor the emperor. <laughs> Golly. These, uh, these emperors were building temples to themselves at the time. Number two, they were spreading misinformation about Christians. Did you know fake news and misinformation was going back to the first century? I always think there's only so many demons out there, right? They, you know, the demons recycle these things. Anyway, they are. They would say Christians were atheists. Why? Because they, didn't, they did not worship the, uh, the Roman pantheon. Uh, at, the, at the Pantheon. They would say that we were immoral and that we were like these uh, people having orgies. Because, they, we, you know, the communion time back then was a whole meal and we called it a love feast. And it was sort of closed off to other Christians. So, come Christians, we're going to have a love feast. Then, you know, how, you know, you know how, how secular people think? Wow. They're just, oh. Uh, okay. So, okay, so they, misinformation. And then they said they were cannibals. Christians were cannibals. You know why? Of course, we were drinking somebody's blood and eating somebody's body. So, like, Christian, they were feeding misinformation, all right? And so, uh, <laughs> and those were the good Roman emperors. <laughs> They're pretty evil. Ah, uh, man. And at one time, we would be forced as Christians to worship the emperor, to give a small token to him, or else we could not trade. There were times that Christians would respectfully say no. In fact, the book of Revelation talks about the Christians that accommodated to the culture and, and honored the emperor too much and actually gave him worship. The, the, Jesus said, you cannot do that. So, so God draws lines in the sand. There are some things you cannot do no matter what our leaders tell us. We were told not to preach the gospel. But the, our, our, our forerunners stood and stood up and said, no, we will obey God and not you because you're telling us what to talk about. There will be a time when the government will restrict what we teach other people and we will respectfully, respectfully disobey and love them and pray for them. We don't get our cues from the surrounding polarized culture. Okay? We just don't. I'm not sure how we do this. I think we can talk about issues. I think we need to debate them. But there's this word of respect and honor. Maybe that's tone. I don't know. But can you come and ask God, let's not be like the culture around us. Let's be Christians as we talk about the issues. Romans 13, 1 to 2 says this. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, in other words, God made this thing called the government. Consequently, it, this doesn't say he actually 
put those people in there, but that's okay. God made the institution. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority, that's the, the government authority, is re rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Uh, so we, we obey God first over the government, but guess what? We still honor them. And wherever God convicts you on that, I will let him do that job there. Uh, one of my favorite uh, TV shows is called Band of Brothers. And I've watched it so many times. It's, uh, it's just a great sort of World War II thing with paratroopers. And at the end of the war, there is this, uh, there's this guy that uh, he, was, uh, he was a junior officer and he was sent off to war. His senior officer, who was a real pain... Uh, stayed back. He, the junior officer comes back now, his senior. And they didn't get along at all. And I remember, I remember they, they pass each other, and uh, the, the, the guy that's now his junior would not salute him. He just sort of walks by. And, and the guy that's gone away and has, has got a rank above him, he stops and says, excuse me, you need to salute me. And the guy looks at him, he says, you salute, you salute the rank, you don't salute the person. I'm going to honor, and as I talk about people in authority, I'm going to give some proper respect and honor, not like the world does, even though I can openly disagree with them. I'm not sure what all that looks like, but all I know is this. We need to pray for them. 1 Timothy 2. I'm going to skip ahead of verse. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. It says this. I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. Again, we need to be praying for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. And this is a request for us to continue to pray for all people. And give thanks for them. God, I want to thank you for you, 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 you. Isn't that great? Those are good prayers. Pray this way. How? This way. For kings. And all those who are in authority. I'm going to intercede for them. I'm going to intercede for them. Why? Why? So that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. So we're going to pray and ask that God would give us space and freedoms so we can continue to preach the gospel. We need to pray this way for our leaders. And so every time anger just stirs up in you about a political situation, and it stirs up in me as I see so many things on the horizon being shut down for Christians, it, it angers me. But then I know, hold on, i got to turn this into prayer, turn this into prayer. Turn, I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to pray that we can live a peaceful, like, coexistence. We're different from the world when Jesus invites us to pray for our enemies. So I'm going to stop and pray. Uh, I'd love you to join in your heart. I'm not quite done the message, all right? So I know this is like the, the time to shut down your, don't shut down the computer yet. Okay, here we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for our Prime Minister Trudeau. He needs you, Jesus. I pray that you'll bring him to yourself. He needs to know the love of his Heavenly Father. So Lord, bring him to you, and Lord, I pray that you would convict him and steer him so that we could live a peaceful life here where we could share the gospel. I pray for Doug Ford. Lord, I pray that as he uh, tries to understand how much opening is going to happen, I pray you'll help us just to, to be more and more opening. But I pray for him. He needs you. He needs to come into your family and love you supremely. And so I pray for his heart and his soul. And I pray that he will allow us to worship. I pray for our, our Mayor Eisenberger and Brenda Johnson, the, the counselor around where our church building is. Lord, I pray that they would both meet you. I want to see them in heaven, God. I pray that how we interact with them would lead them to you, God. And I pray that Hamilton will be a place where your gospel is free and powerfully to be spoken. And that no restrictions will be put on it, God. And that your word would go forward here because of how you work through our leaders. So I bring these people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, beyond everyone else, we honor God. We honor God first and overall. One of the beautiful things I love is David asked often and obeyed every time, didn't he? 
He just kept on asking God, asking God, asking God, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And he always obeyed every time. And so here is my last point. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up. We want you, and I want to. I want to honor God when we, like King David, just ask and obey. How can we honor God? I think it's through just saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to love today? I'm here at my local church. Is there anybody I want to pray for? Is there anybody I can speak into? God, just help me to know because I want to ask you and I want to obey you. God, who should I give and, and how should I interact? And, and God, who should I, I, I go and ask forgiveness for? And when I go to the communion tables and I, I get that straight in my life, I make sure I get my stuff straight with you, God. I want to know, God, I, and you just keep on asking and asking. And I think that is a heart after God, isn't it? If uh, nothing else, I think that's what David showed us. He honored God by actually asking and obeying. So we honor God when we ask and obey. And I'm going to ask us to listen to God, to say, God, what would you have me do even in the next few minutes? So Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Oh, God, I want to thank you that we are a type of person that in the midst of conflict, in the midst of, of sometimes having to say no, we do th so with, with honor and respect because we are your children. God, I, help, I just pray that you'll please help us to be people who ask you often and obey always. So, Lord, during these next few moments as we worship, Lead on, O King Eternal, in Jesus' name, amen. So, Kate, why don't you, uh, I know that uh, you get to collect some of the questions, mm -hmm. but I, I thought you had a really neat insight just about what honor was. Why? Mm -hmm. As uh, we were worshiping, I was like, love, so honor feels very practical. It feels like maybe the practical outworking of both love and humility. I don't know, like, they're interconnected. So what does love look like as we do it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Love it. I don't Love know. It. It's just interesting. You think, like, Dave went there, right? <laughs> <laughs> went there with some politics, which is, is so important. It's where we live right now. So, I like, my first question, before we get to the other one that was sent in, was what happens, and tell me I'm not the only one. You're sitting around a table. It's Canada. The last 18 months we've had. And the conversation turns yucky. And it's just kind of filled with scorn, mockery, maybe disgust. Like, what do you do? in those moments where you're like, okay, my, my role here is to be honoring. Yeah, that's, I, I always think it's, it, we can talk about the issues, like, so talk about the, the, the ideas, but once it becomes personal attacks, then I, I think then we have to pull back on the personal attacks. And I, I think we need to try and pray for, uh, we've been asked to pray for our enemies, right? And uh, I know some of these people do not have our best interest at hand, but guess what? That's, that's what an enemy is. So we pray for them. So let's talk issues. But then once people start scorning and, and start saying, I, you know, if I saw them dying, I would not help them. You go, hold on. Whoa. You know what? I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, and I will love, and uh, I will honor these people, not just because they're human beings, but basically because they're also put in a place of authority. So I think there's a difference between uh, persons and, and issues. That's, that's how I deal with it. Any good insight from you, uh, Kate? <laughs> no, that's a good one. It is tricky. I find it really tricky. And you don't want to be that person that stands up and like, too good for this conversation. It's a little yeah, bit self-righteous. Yeah, totally. Like, I'm just going to walk away from it. Because we have to learn how to have conversations and disagree. Yeah. Like, we talked about that. We, yeah. This is a crazy time. Canada it does is. not love having conversations where we have different opinions <laughs> in love. So how can we, as a body of believers, love so well and be convicted at the same time? It's a, yeah. I feel like that's an invitation for us to walk into. Yeah. How do yeah. we practice that? So Thank you. true. A great one came in um, through Facebook. Thank you so much for sending it in. And this touches on parents. So you mentioned this. Um, and this is not, a, like, sadly, this is a reality for people. Yeah. If you've got a toxic relationship with parents um, and you believe that you're able to forgive them for what they've done but still choose not to associate with them, um, is that how you can honor them? So this is a, it's a loaded one. It's very practical. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to your situation because I don't know all the ins and outs of that. So that's really true. I can tell you what other people have done because I've had a great relationship with my parents. So I can give you examples. I think sometimes there's time 
there's uh, time, and uh, you know, if you think your your parents are going to hurt your children, then you got to keep your kids safe, and that's true. You got to you got to put some space between that. But often I've seen people over time to be able to go back and still show love and honor in uh, places where they've been hurt deeply. And um, uh, again, I think you just need to ask Jesus about the timing of that and the spirit of that. Uh, and I, I, it's, yeah, that's, that's what I say. And uh, I know when, uh, when sometimes their names are brought up in conversations where we can easily rip them down. But uh, if we can be honoring, especially around uh, the grandkids, in that way they can, uh, they can somehow see, see uh, some redeemable qualities from these people. But yes, uh, just like I was saying with King David, he was asked to go back to the palace. He didn't. So you don't have to always go and have face-to-face all the time. But uh, there's a way of talking and, and showing respect. Can I get really personal? <laughs> yeah. As a hallmark, I guess. Uh, t- a while ago, my parents divorced. They were like six months short of their 30th wedding anniversary. I was totally rocked. Wow. And it really, really hurt. I felt super betrayed. And uh, like everything you th- I think you feel when that happens. And um, the path towards honor was a very long one for me it felt like a year long but it was choices over and over to say like I actually choose relationship and so practically for me what that looked like is I wouldn't participate in conversations with my brother and sister that was uh, that kind of tore them down so I just I just kind of gently kept saying you know we can choose love like we can just choose to enter in and love and I'm so grateful to have like rock in relationships with both my parents and um, I genuinely love them that is my own story it's not Anybody Thanks so much, Kate. No problem. I don't have any other questions. Okay. I want to say thank you for talking yeah, yeah. about that, though. It feels yeah. really practical and very important. Thank and you, Kate. And a key piece yeah. of the heart. Um, there are a couple of things that we can do, like, to honor the Lord, I think. Um, the prayer summit is tonight. It's 8 o'clock. Woo! Church on the Rock is built on prayer. And as, we were, as I was thinking about this, I was like, you know, I think I've come to honor um, leadership in the past, but it's much bigger than that. Like, who are we honoring with our prayers when we sacrifice and commit the time? It's the Lord. Anything you'd add to that? Eight o'clock, one hour, really. If you love Church on the Rock, I'm not trying to guilt you into it. This is the engine of what we do. So could you consider coming on for one hour? It's fun. It's quick. Uh, And yeah, as, as, as your pastor, I am, I am waiting for miraculous things to happen, and I'm praying for these things daily. But I, it just so encourages me to see our people come alongside of me and our leadership and praying. So uh, I would invite you all to come and do that. Thanks. Uh, one last uh, event to let you know about that is coming up, and it is a youth event. If you're in grades 5 to 12, this is uh, Friday, July 30th, um, and it will be on the prayer path. It's based around a campfire. You can register online at Church in the Rock. It's going to be great. So, again, that's if you're in grades 5 to 12, coming out for a connection night on July 30th. Uh, and, again, we can you can always, um, back to the beginning of the service, sacrifice with your tithes and offerings online at gifts at churchontherock.ca. Okay, I've got one more thing, all right, before we head out. Okay, a lot of people might not know, we don't talk a lot about our uh, vision team, and uh, <laughs> uh, our vision team is like our elders, and uh, they're the people, I, they are my authority, and uh, I so respect and honor each one, and uh, I love being under their protection, and it is a good thing. Uh, a lot of you might not know, Kate Masson here is the chair of our vision team, and uh, she has been called to go and study for a year in California, and uh, at uh, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, is that right? And uh, so her, her husband, Tim, and uh, uh, yeah, your, your kids are heading down there. And so could we as a church pray for them that God would do great things? And when you folks come back, that uh, you and uh, Noah, little Jasper, will all come and, uh, yeah, love Jesus more. If you could sit there, if you don't mind, just sitting there. Could we all stand, please? Stand in honor. Heavenly Father, I honor people who have worked hard here at this church and those in authority, our vision team. I want especially to thank you for the chair of our vision team here, Kate. I pray for Jasper, Noah, Tim, and her. As they head on down to California, could, if you're here, could you just reach out your hand towards Kate? And we pray for their whole family. 
We pray that they will deepen their walk in you. I pray that they will hear often from you. And that this next year will be a year that will build foundations of their spiritual walk that will last the rest of their lives. God, please in your mercy, bring them back to us so that we can be refreshed with what you have done with them in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for logging on, for being a part of Church on the Rock. Go and have a great week, everyone.